<laughs> Hi, boys and girls. I think we borrowed liberally from the the Archie Bunker, Carol O'Connor archetype for Stan. And I'm also a, a film and TV geek to the max. And so I also borrowed from my heroes whenever I can. I sprinkled in a little Sterling Hayden and we we stole completely the chops and the facial hair I have for Stan from uh, Quint, uh, Robert Shaw's character in Jaws. And that's not by mistake, it's an outright steal because I completely, I don't even know what kind of human beings they were. For all I know, they, I have no idea. But they both impacted me in a huge way growing up, both Shaw in The Sting and in everything. Uh, and Jaws and Sterling Hayden in everything he ever did from Strange Love on. And so if you're going to borrow, I figure you borrow from those guys. And I told Dana that and we, we have very similar sensibilities. And so your eye and your ear are really good because those are, those are the guys. How important is humor in this? Say again? How important is humor in this? Well, here's the thing about Stan. It, horror comedy is tricky. There, there's not that many great ones. So we're, the top of the pyramid for me and for Dana is an American Werewolf in London, John Landis's American Werewolf in London. And the reason it's so good to me is that if there's two extremes in those spectrums, one, I'm making this up, but one Scooby-Doo, where it's funny, but the monsters are largely denuded. So you can crack a joke, but the monsters aren't a threat. And the other extreme is The Exorcist, where it's really scary, but aside from Lee J. Cobb making a couple of jokes, you can't really break a joke in The Exorcist. And so in the middle there, if you want to straddle those two, it's fucking hard. Because jokes can't be at the monster's expense, because then the monsters are not much of a threat, but the monsters can't step on the jokes. And so that's what we're trying to do in Stan. And it's it's hard. It works. It's hard. So part of the theme in this is, is the pathos of your character and his tragedy. Can you talk a little about bringing that to it? Because that's one of the things that always gets me with with, with these characters. Is I love them because of their broken heart. It's a great question. And uh, as a producer, the number one thing I wanted to protect. You have to hang on to a couple things in post production because. Once you get to post, everybody is Orson Welles, and nobody's Orson. Orson Welles is Orson Welles. <laughs> and so one of the things I wanted to hang on to last year, and it's just a tiny, it's, it's 20 frames, is Stan touching that keychain, uh, her missing key when he comes into the house. And I think it was important because Stan is, as you were suggesting, he's, he's wounded. He's an injured guy. His wife of 27 years uh, is dead, and he's got fired from his job. So the two things that anchor this guy are gone. So now it's what he's supposed to do. And so uh, that's what I locked into, this, this wounded guy. And the fact that he now has to, even wounded, he has to somehow make his way through this landscape of fucking witches. Um, <laughs> Call action and get out of my goddamn eye line. I want to play that guy. Let's 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 excavate. Let's see who that guy is. Let's dust off his shit. Let's see what that guy's gonna do when a witch comes up. To him. He takes a, a pipe and bashes it over the fucking head. What else is he gonna do? Right. He, he lost his wife. Correct. So it's great. And so the overriding arc last year was for Stan at all times to be back in his chair watching the History Channel drinking five dozen beers. And whenever he wasn't in his chair doing that, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. This year, for me, the arc was to get whole again. And the only way he could get whole, and this goes back to your original question, is to get his wife back. But she's been dead for a year. So how are we going to do that? Season two. <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> so how does that change Stan as a character? Like, how does it sort of, like you said, dig up from his rough it, ex edge? it exposes some emotional uh, land, just gold mines that he didn't know were there, and but Dana did, and so 
exposing those about four different times was the stuff that actors' dreams are made of. Because you go into Stan, you go into Archie, although what, what Carol did with Archie uh, is there's plenty of emotional stuff with Archie, but you get to work backwards with these guys because unless we find... If the guy's if the guy's a little rough around the edges and he's a little bit of a, a marginal jackass, but just because he's operating out of fear and being a wounded, injured guy, we got to find a way to reconcile that. Otherwise, I'm changing the channel. And so, Stan, we we find out why we forgive him his trespasses this year. We're seeing Atlanta become the Hollywood of the South, basically. So what has been your experiences you know, filming there? Well, I did 42. I did Jackie Robinson, the Jackie Robinson movie down there, 42. And I was only there for a week, and we are in this huge um, soundstage. And so I didn't really... We could have been in London for all... It, it was the same. Once you're in an interior in a soundstage, you could be anywhere on the planet. But Stan, uh, a lot of it are exteriors. And so... Uh, my experience in Atlanta has been that the crews are fantastic. A lot of technical people have moved down there from Los Angeles and because uh, the cost of living is cheaper. The unions are strong. Uh, it's just that the producers move it down there because there's about a 14% kickback. So of every $100,000 you spend, you get 14 grand back. I think Louisiana is around 17%. So that's a heck of an incentive. The biggest, the two biggest ways I can contribute as a producer on Stand Against Evil is to encourage the writers to get the actors the scripts earlier since it's eight episodes in five weeks, which is preposterous. And so unless the actors have the words uh, and, and their arcs and know how to work backwards since we're going to be shooting episode 8 and then episode 1 and then episode 2 and then episode, and the deck's just going to be shuffled every day when you get to the set so unless you can rehearse it like a play prior to coming to Atlanta it's probably not going to work out so I can, I can try to get the words from the writers earlier and then while we're shooting I can create a space on the set that's safe for the actors to explore my perception of safe creatively. I don't mean physically. I mean creatively. And then in post, I'm really comfortable. I had a post-production company in New York for about 10 years in the Brill Building, and I, I'm very comfortable in post, and I can make everyone's lives easier because I have a photographic memory for what we shot. And so if the editor is really wrestling with how to get out of that scene, I can say, let's let's go to the end of that fourth take. There's this really interesting thing Janet did that you may not have seen because you used the first take. Just go to the end of the, humor me, go to the end of the fourth take. Just look at this lovely thing that Janet did. And we're like, oh, I didn't see that. I'm like, I know you did. It's okay. <laughs> I, I know you I know you didn't, but that's what you're going to go out on. I mean, it's amazing you can pick up on those little nuances like that. So. It's, a, it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> oh. In the strangest crossover hypothetical situation, how would Stan react if he met Dr. Counts? How would he try? <laughs> it would depend on whether or not he needed him. Because you got to remember, Cox is much of a pain in the ass as he was. He's the best doctor in Sacred Heart. And in the bottom of the ninth, if you have an issue, you want Cox. Uh, medically. Uh, <laughs> not spiritually or emotionally. Uh, so if, if he needed him, I think he would, he would be able to process him. Otherwise, I think he'd cross the other side of the street to avoid him. So they're both alphas, and they're both... I don't know if Stan was ever as good at his job as, as Dr. Cox was, but he was good at his job, but he got fired. Stan got fired. So he didn't get to go out on his own terms, which re goes back to your sense of being wounded or injured. I don't know how many have been fired from jobs, but it sucks. And you always look at the person in the mirror every morning and it just become this pool of inadequacy and blame. And it's this horrible circle. Where you circle the drain and blaming yourself for getting fired. And it sucks. It may have had nothing to do with you. But Stan got fired at the bottom of the ninth after 27 years. 
in conjunction with his wife dying. That blows. Stan's relationship with his daughter. How is that going to be? our last question. What we found last year with Deborah, uh, who's almost a female Jonathan Winters, uh, and I mean that in the ultimate compliment in the history of showbiz, um, is that we had to frame her in scenes where she could, the actor could succeed. So in other words, if she had to do the who, what, where, when, how, all the expository shit, we weren't using her properly. We plugged into kind of a female Jonathan Winters with her, and she steals season two. Instead of having to cut all her stuff out, because the show's 21 minutes and 35 seconds, and when you call action and let Deborah do some of her magic, you don't want to call cut, even though it has nothing to do with the show. You just want to watch her, because she's great. And so this year, we, we put her in a position to crush, and she did. Like you read about, for Deborah, because she's great at it. I mean, actors come in and they say, oh, well, I just want to improv. And it's like, well, yeah, but you suck at it. So <laughs> say what's on the page. It'll serve everyone a lot better. But Deborah's one of those rare actors who can just, she's got game. And hardly anybody does when it comes, like Neil Flynn on the janitor on Scrubs. He's an improv doctor. He's an expert. And Deborah's, well, she's right up there with me. Like the ultimate compliment Billy Lawrence used to give Neil Flynn, who played the janitor on Scrubs, was, and these are micromanaging freaks, these executive producers of TV shows. And, you know, you better say the and and the but and the the and the uh. And for Neil's character all the time, Billy would write in the margins, uh, Neil will think of something. <laughs> in the middle of a script. Hugest compliment ever. Yeah, that's a compliment. Thanks, See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's a great question. Oh, thank you.